Cage Time with John Morgan. And we're back for another episode of Cage Side with John Morgan. I am your host, Eric McMahon. What a weekend we had. BKFC, Platinum Mike Perry, TKO's Luke, Rock, Luke, T- TKO's Luke Rockhold in the second. Then Conor McGregor jumps in the squared circle for this friendly yet oddly intense stare down with some friendly banter back and forth. Coming up, we have UFC 288, Aljermaine Sterling, the human backpack versus Triple C, Henry Cejudo, the man to help me break it all down. John Morgan, you can follow him on Twitter at John Morgan underscore MMA. What's up, brother? Crazy, man. What a crazy weekend it was. As you said, that that madness between Conor McGregor and Mike Perry, I couldn't tell if they were really being friends or they were about to erupt into a fight or what was happening. And then, as you said, busy week this week. I'm actually heading to Denver for one championship as well, the first ever event in the United States. So much going on, my man. Yeah, so let's. I, I, I want to dive right into this BKFC, right? Because it was untested and unproven from a pay-per-view model. I don't see any projections, but if we're talking clickbait, this was a massive, massive success. So let's get right into the main event because I have a lot of questions surrounding that that I want your opinion on. And then we have to obviously talk about Conor McGregor. And this guy's going to make headlines anywhere he goes anything he does first of all early in the night we see him popping bottles like he's drinking whiskey i mean he's having like connor's living his best life at bkfc but mike perry platinum mike perry luke rockhold main event ends in a tko retirement in the second round uh luke rockhold got some of those chiclets just cracked in half and Mike Perry, who we know what he does is he doesn't give a damn. He's going to move forward. Uh, what did you think of the fight to begin with? Overall, man, uh, you know, kind of what I thought we would see. Not necessarily the ending. I mean, I didn't necessarily see Luke Rockhold's teeth getting shattered. But I just thought Mike Perry kind of has the experience in this bare knuckle. And what we've seen is it really does take some adjustment, right? It's, it's not quite boxing because you can't just throw freely. You know, you have to be really careful in the way you punch because if you end up breaking your hand, you're in a really bad situation. Meanwhile, Luke Rockhold, I mean, he's a phenomenal fighter, but when you really think of Luke Rockhold, personally, I think of his powerful kicks, Mm -hmm. I think of his great grappling game, and he couldn't use any of that here. Now, he had the size advantage, but with Mike Perry, who's used to being kind of the smaller guy in there anyway, who's used to fighting on the inside, this is kind of what I thought we would see. So the fight went about the way I thought it would go, other than, of course, you know, the ending happening the way it did, but I thought Mike Perry was going to have his hand raised in this, but... To your point about everything, this was a huge event for Bear Knuckle Fighting Championship, man. I mean, there was a UFC event the same night, and I saw nobody talking about the UFC because everybody was talking about BKFC. So I think, as you said, no projections. We don't know what the exact numbers were, but in terms of just fan interest and discussion and and people talking about it, this was a banner night for BKFC. Yeah, it was fun. I uh, refed an MMA card and I was able to jump on and uh, kind of watch the the tail end of the card, being the co-main and the main after my refing duties were done for the night. But I wanted to kind of go back and piggyback on a point that you made about the, 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 the attributes that Luke Rockhold have that he was not able to use. Now, you say when you first think about Luke Rockhold, you think about these powerful kicks. I do as well. But that's second to me about his outstanding grappling. What people really miss on Luke Rockhold is he is a world-class grappler. World-class. If you even watched what he did to, um, oh gosh, middleweight champ at the time. uh, One who broke Anderson Silva's leg. um, Michael Bisping? Oh, no, 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 Chris no, no. Weidman. I guess Chris Weidman. Chris Weidman. If you watch, and Chris Weidman is an elite grappler and an elite wrestler. And Luke Rockhold made him look like a child on the ground. That's how good Luke Rockhold is on the ground. Then the next thing is he's got world class kicks. Both those were taken out of the kick, out of out of out of the you know ability to do so. So looking at it, I still thought that Rockhold had the size, the strength, the reach, the technical ability to still get it done, and he didn't. Platinum Mike Perry had the one attribute that you need for this game, and that is being effing crazy. (laughs) He does. Listen, Mike Perry was designed 
for bare knuckle fighting championship, man. These two, this, this, this man and this organization to me are a match made in heaven. It's his style. It's his game, but it's the whole package as well. You know, the, the wild pre-fight press conferences, the wild, you know, the, the whole presentation of everything. I mean, platinum Mike Perry was made for this stuff. So, you know, he said he afterwards, he's a free agent, but I got to believe they find a way to sign him and to bring him back because this, this to me, marriage made in heaven between this guy and this organization. Yeah. I mean, and he's just fun, right? If you get him outside of all this craziness, he seems like a just a like a cool ass guy. He does, and it seems like he's in a better place now as well. You know, he's look. He Mike Perry has has done some things. He's seen some things. He's been through some things. But it seems like he's kind of moving past that now. You know, he's a father, and he, he is, of course he's a little bit wild when he gets in there. But I think he understands what he has to do outside of the ring uh, to still be successful and, and to keep his life in order. And it seems like he's kind of reached that peace now in that place. And, and again, I, I just, I got to think that BKSC finds a way to bring him back. When I was watching this fight and tell me if you, if you agree with kind of my assessment and uh, this is no disrespect to Luke Rockhold because he would beat my ass in a second. Let's keep that crystal clear. But I looked at it as I thought from afar that Luke Rockhold thought he would dispatch of Mike Perry very quickly. I think that he went in there and say, my length and everything is I'm going to clip him with no gloves on. He is going to crumble under my power. I'm the bigger, stronger man. And when he first cracked Mike Perry very hard, that made make, made uh, Platinum stumble. And then just he wouldn't stop coming forward. And then those body shots just crack and crack into the body, crack into the head. I think Luke had to come to Jesus moment. I do. I, I think he thought he was going to go out there and kind of out finesse Mike Perry in this game. And unfortunately, Mike Perry does have that dog in him. You know what I mean? He is that wild man that you're not going to out finesse him. And sometimes I feel like, and, and I think Luke got over this hump a little bit in, in his last UFC appearance. Obviously, you know, didn't necessarily go his way, but uh, went out there and, and fought and battles. And sometimes I think he's trying to overthink it out there, right? He's trying to be a little too fin- fancy. He's trying to, as you said, finesse, you know, all those things. He's trying to overthink it a little bit and not just going out there. And just tapping into that, you know, we talk about sometimes you have athletes in mixed martial arts and then you have fighters. And I think Luke Rockhold is an athlete and he has the ability to flip that switch into that nasty fighter. But he just, you know, doesn't necessarily do it all the time. I think that would have served him well here is just to treat this like it's a street fight, man. Like, like, like your, your life and safety depends on it. And I think that's what Mike Perry does when he goes in there. So the ending, there was a lot of confusion in the moment about the ending of that fight. Nobody really knew, and he started pointing to his mouth a little bit, and uh, they're like, oh, something's wrong with his mouth. He comes out the next day with an Instagram post saying, like, look at my stuff. And, I mean, he's got teeth cracked in half, and he's saying, I'm looking forward to fight again, but maybe with gloves this time. But I have to pose this question, and I don't like that I'm doing it because, I, I, listen, self-admittedly, Luke, Luke Rockhold's got twice the balls twice the guts is a hundred times the fighter and grappler than I will ever could be, will be, or ever think to be. But if Mike Perry was in that same situation with his teeth cracked in half, would he have retired? What do you think? Hmm, tough to say. Probably not just because he's a little bit crazy. I mean, I, I think it's the right thing to do. I, don't, I yeah. don't think that's necessarily a bad thing that Luke Rockhold said, hey, man, my teeth are cracked like I'm out right now. But yeah, I mean, I think Mike Perry is crazy enough that he'd be like, well, spit those things out. We'll get we'll get some veneers coming up in here soon. We'll, <laughs> we'll get something posted. Uh, we got to keep this fight going. So yeah, I, I think you're right about that. But I, I will certainly not question Luke Rockhold's no. decision to do so because I think it's the right thing. Live to fight another day. Well, and like, listen, you know, love him or hate him, Luke Rockhold makes a lot of money with this right here, that pretty little face of his. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Got to keep that intact. So keep those modeling gigs coming. Yes. Now, let's get to the point, right? That it's kind of crazy that that became secondary to what we're about to talk about. Conor McGregor is in attendance for that fight, and in true blue, I guess Mike Perry fashion. He's going to call out Conor McGregor, but he does it. He says, I want Conor in here for a face-off. And which, well, I guess it didn't surprise me that BKFC invited him. It didn't, it invited him in. It surprised the hell out of me that Conor got in there, right? We'll talk about the ramifications with the UFC here in a second. But they get in, and then they start having this back-and-forth discussion with smiles on their face. 
But I'm waiting for one little fuse, one person to say the wrong thing with the wrong tone before this just combusts. Were you kind of looking at it the same way? A hundred percent. It's that thing, you know, when you're kind of messing with some, oh, we're a little wrestling here, a little, oh, we're just having fun. Everybody's smiling and laughing. And then the next thing you know, people are throwing punches because somebody's like, hey, get out of my face, man. What are you doing right now? This is not funny. So absolutely, it was it was tension. I mean, I, I saw the smiles. I saw the laugh. But both those guys kind of have that crazy smile, that crazy laugh where it, it, could, it could flip in a second. So absolutely, I was a little bit worried uh, that things were about to pop off. They didn't. It ended up being just an interesting talking point. But in the moment, watching it live, especially, yeah, you're wondering what in God's name is going to happen next. And if you notice, neither one of them took a back step. They were facing off. They were both, like, game-faced. They were talking matter-of-factly to each other, not, like, exchanging pleasantries. They were talking very matter-of-factly back and forth to each other, and I'm just like, dude, Platinum, do you right now. Say something fucking crazy. Oops, I shouldn't have said that. Say something <laughs> crazy right now. Connor, react the way I want you to react. Do something crazy back, and let's see what happens. And you could see the owner of VKFC was like, just kind of lingering right there. Like, if something really goes down, I need to stop this. Well, it's one of those weird things, right? And and, and you see it all the time. With I mean, that's kind of what the face-offs are all the time, right? It's it's good. It's good marketing. You want to see two guys going against each other. And the more tension is on the line, the better, because that gets people talking, and that sells pay-per-views and all that. But if it crosses that line, what is it going to see President Dana White say all the time? I got to make sure that those guys don't touch each other. My only job is to make sure they don't touch each other because things can t- turn crazy real quick. And especially in that situation, you don't have, you know, proper security like you do on a stage and all that there's too many people to really control so I think David Feldman was on the one hand smiling and going my good fortune I've got Conor McGregor the biggest star in 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 mixed martial arts here in my ring however if this turns ugly real quick and we have a brawl like this could be awful so you're kind of walking that that razor thin tightrope of hey this is good but it could go real bad real fast and we're secretly hoping for it I mean, you know, you don't want anybody to get hurt or anything. Well, I but get the hurt, but I want to see the circus. It's already crazy. BKFC is already crazy. So, yeah, the crazier the better. I mean, yeah, I, I, I was I was for it. <laughs> All right, so now let's get into post-mortem about this, right? Dana White cannot be happy. Can't be. Can't be happy. Oh. <laughs> Were you surprised that Connor got in the, got in the ring? I mean, I don't – look, you, you mentioned it earlier, right? He's taking a few swigs off the proper 12 bottle. You know, I don't think he's necessarily thinking things all the way through at the moment. But at the end of the day, I think Connor realizes, hey, I'm a business partner with the UFC, but I don't have to only be loyal to the UFC. You know, I, I can create my own opportunities and my own options as well. So, you know, had, had Connor McGregor been – completely sober at the moment had a chance to really think it through I think he probably still would have made the same decision to be honest with you and that is hey I'm Conor McGregor and I do what I want and you know is this going to make UFC President Dana White mad I'm sure it did I'm sure Dana was not I mean look Dana's gotten to a point now where he's like whatever I'll just deal with whatever comes and I'll move on it but this couldn't have been ideal for him it couldn't have been hey that's great you see where our guy was this is awesome so yeah I, I don't think it probably made him happy so afterwards, then Mike Perry calls out, uh, you know, that says that he's a free agent, but he, uh, and, and things of that nature, but he does lay down a challenge to Conor McGregor. He lays that challenge out there. Any, is there any scenario that you put past a 0.0% chance that that ever happens? No, to be honest <laughs> with you, I don't, <laughs> there's not, there's, I mean, look, in the future, maybe, like once Conor McGregor has finished with his USC contract and maybe we're a few years down the line, absolutely, I could see it. Like when Conor McGregor gets in there and says, hey, man, I am down with this game. I am I'm okay. I believe that. I, I 100% Conor loves combat sports. And, and he saw a great show. I mean, we didn't even talk about the co-main event, but what a phenomenal well, we'll fight that there. was. And I know Conor was probably excited about it. So when he steps in there and says, I love this stuff and I would do it. I 100% believe him. I think, you know, obviously the, the, the money's got to be right, but we know what a star he is. He would command huge pay-per-view sales. So, I mean, he you could make the money situation right, but it's not going to happen while he's under contract with the UFC. Yes, the UFC was involved with Conor McGregor, Floyd Mayweather, but that was a once-in-a-lifetime type situation. And it was co-promoted. Situation. It was co-promoted, right. And it was they would have to co-promote here to make this happen while he's under contract with the UFC. And I just... 
I just don't see them there being a motivation for the UFC to want to get involved in this. Um, I know behind the scenes, uh, I, I think a lot of the UFC brass doesn't exactly you know love seeing their retired fighters go to BKFC because of you know the the, the physical damage that you see taken in there. So I don't think they're necessarily the biggest fans of the organization to begin with. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just don't see the motivation for them working together. So could it happen in the future? It could happen in the future, but is it happening in the immediate future? Absolutely not. I put it right at that 0.00% chance. And let's be honest, if the USC ever wanted, or if if uh, Connor ever wanted to do this, Dana would set it up under his promotion in a special rules. He ain't, he ain't sending that talent and, and that spectacle to uh, BKFC. Just imagine... If we had, I mean, it would be sanctioned under the UFC banner, but not mixed martial arts. And Dana White could promote, we'll just say, a main event bare knuckle fight with Conor McGregor. You know, we he, he, Conor McGregor's, you know, done around a million pay per view buys. That might get too. Uh, you know, uh, especially against the right opponent. I mean, you put it up against a Mike Perry, who's who's going to be wild, who's got some success. I mean, he's gonna who's gonna have some heat. I mean, listen, it was all respect. I mean, Mike Perry was giving Connor a lot of respect mm-hmm. in there, but if, you know, if their signatures are down on a contract for your future fight date, I think he could be respectful and still talk a little bit of trash and still fire things up. I mean, Mike Perry is good at that. He he makes it fun. You know, it's a little bit outlandish with some of the things he says. But it's wild and it's fun. So, yeah, absolutely. People would be drawn to that. And Conor McGregor, look, at his at his core, I mean, he loves uh, striking. He loves boxing, you know. And and, and I, I'm sure he would love to, to throw those things without any gloves on. So, it could absolutely, with the right opponent, you could absolutely generate a ton of interest in this. And it would just be, then you start getting, like, the mainstream involved because now there's controversy. Oh, he's leaving the UFC or he's doing this new sport. And what is this sport? It, you know. Then you start talking about should it even be sanctioned and all those things that happen. So it would get a ton of interest. Could could you ever see a scenario that that Dana White and the AFC would promote like a one off Conor McGregor, Mike Perry, bare knuckle fighting match as the main event of a of an MMA card? Now that not being an MMA fight, but just being a one off because Dana White has always come out and said like, yeah, we do MMA. We don't do all these other things. We're best in class at MMA. But I mean, gosh, the numbers that would do. The numbers would be insane, but you, you you hit the nail on the head. I just don't think they would do it. I mean, that's not their core business model. And you think about how many years, you know, they fought for, for acceptance. I mean, you remember MMA wasn't legal. They had to show people, well, no, we had these things in place, and this is what makes it safer, and this is why it should happen. And then they kind of throw that out the window and be like, oh, yeah, but we're going to go do this now. Now, could you do a situation, you know, take, it, take a look at something like Power Slap, right? Power Slap is very much tied to the UFC, but not really, right? It's not part of that brand i mean yes dana has used uh the social media power of the usc and all those to do a separate brand so could i see maybe a one-off under a different type of name a a different promotion that they didn't use the usc to help i could potentially see that but i will go back to this i've heard some usc brass kind of you know behind the scenes that don't seem to be the biggest fan of bkfc and, and, and and the damage that it does to fighters and it kind of the visual of what happens there. So for that reason, I don't know that they'd be motivated to do it, but if it, if it ever happened, were it ever to happen, I just don't think it would happen under the USC banner. All right. Moving to the co-main event, which was wildly, wildly entertaining. Eddie Alvarez versus Chad money. Mendez. Ch- uh, Eddie Alvarez wins a split decision victory. Chad Mendez retires from all mix uh, from all combat sports. Effectively after that, fight that was just a fun fight between two guys who looked like clones of each other it was man i mean when that fight first got announced on paper i think we all kind of perked up and we're like oh that's gonna be a scrap but rarely does it ever deliver to that i mean that's one of the greatest fights in bare knuckle history right and it's two mma legends right two guys that we all know you know had that same fight happen between just two random dudes that we'd never heard of it'd still be an amazing scrap but it's elevated to another level when it's those stars that you had there that were all so familiar with their body of work and everything they've done. So, man, props to those two dudes. They went out there and laid it on the line. I did get that one wrong going in. I thought Chad Mendez was going to have the advantage here. Granted, he didn't have a ton of experience. You know, he had the one fight, but it was very, very short uh, in his debut. But he still had a little bit more experience. And, um, I, you know, as I said going in, my, my biggest concern is that one of the reasons we love Eddie Alvarez is because he's shown us an incredible chin. He's been in incredible wars, right? I mean, we've seen Eddie Alvarez get hit in every fight, and then he picks himself up off the deck, and he comes and he, and he keeps going. 
but I just wasn't sure he was going to be able to do that in a bare knuckle environment, right? I was afraid either, you know, the, 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 you know, the concussive nature of it or some cuts or something like that would get in the way. But man, if, if these two dudes didn't go toe to toe, back and back, back and forth, just dropping each other. And, 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 and I mean, just put on a show and uh, wish Chad Mendez nothing but the best in retirement, man. I, I love following his career and, and uh, look, Eddie Alvarez still putting on big fights as well, man. Unbelievable. The underground King does mm. it again. And he did exactly what we said he was going to do. And listen, we're no no Nostradamus here because he's literally done it in every fight. The fight does not start until he gets knocked down. That's it. <laughs> and he got knocked down in round number two, follows that up with him knocking down Money Mendez in round three. Then it's just a war from there. And every punch that was thrown by both of these just legends of the game were thrown with horrendously bad intentions. Unbelievable. Just out there dropping bombs. I mean, again, on paper, this looked like it was going to be a great matchup. When it was announced, I thought, oh, this is going to be fun, but not like that kind of fun. I mean, that was crazy. That was two dudes laying it all on the line. And, uh, you know, I I'm sure they both got well compensated for it, and they absolutely deserved it, man. They, they went out there and brought it. Like I said, one of the best fights we've ever seen in BKFC history. They set the stage for that main event perfectly. And, uh, yeah, man, happy for Chad Mendez. You know, so, some kind of what-ifs uh, along uh, the way for his MMA career. But uh, but the dude was fighting at a high level for an awful long time, man. And, and, and even though, you know, you'd like to go out in, in victory in retirement, man, going out with an effort like that, not a – not a thing to hang your head about whatsoever. Put on an absolute war and, uh, you know, wish him all the best with his, with his business success and everything that he's doing outside of the cage next. I mean, and listen, even next week, even today, nobody's even really saying who won and lost that fight, right? It was no. just an awesome fight. And the one thing I do have to say about Chaz Mendez, Chad Mendez, is that explosiveness that he had, he still had that in spirit fades on saturday night Absolutely. albeit in a loss but eddie alvarez was just cool calm and composed and would just do 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 rattle back counter shots well that's i think that's what's great about this retirement for chad is that it's not like oh well man chad just doesn't have it anymore man like yeah it's it's time he hangs it up it's like nah man this guy goes out yes on a loss but as you said i mean this is like you know forrest griffin stefan bonner type stuff where the the result doesn't even matter it was just like a landmark result a landmark battle and one that people will always talk about i think this is one of those fights that will live in the history of bkfc for as long as the promotion is around and so uh you know for, for chad to hang him up it's not as if oh well he's just not competitive anymore it's just no I, i've got a passion for things outside of the sport now and and i want to focus on those and eddie alvarez once again establishing himself as a marketable fighter a dude you want to pay c i mean Here's a guy, too, that has followed his own path, right? I mean, has fought everywhere. Just, you know, never cared about what organization he was working for. He just wanted to know who would give him the highest check because that's where he was going to go. And he would go out there and give you 100% of what he had for that money. He wasn't trying to just take money from you. He was going to give you what you paid for and, and continues to go out and just put on incredible battles, man. It's, uh, it's phenomenal stuff. It really was. Uh, switching topics really quick, I do want to touch on Francis Ngannou. We touched on him a couple weeks ago and about the – I guess the loss of opportunity has why he's losing these opportunities. Is he a little unrealistic? Is he still hurt? All that is still on the table, but another one of the major promotions. Now let's go down the list. Bellator is out. UFC's out. Um, PFL may or may not still be talking to him, but it seems like it is out. And now one championship, the last big promotion comes out yesterday and saying they are not negotiating with Francis Ngannou anymore. He's a nice guy. We agree on a lot of things, but we cannot agree. I do think money is a big factor in this, but what they, what he, what he came out and said is we do not agree and we are not aligned on non-financial issues. And if I'm going to read through the line, it's that union union stuff. It's all that talk. And like, I really want these fighters to get it through their head. That is not going to happen especially you have independent promotions how are you going to even unionize that way so i don't know what is going on with francis Gano. just touch on it a little bit and 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 i'm starting to feel bad for the guy like the earning power that he has has drastically diminished now he may know something that we don't and he's got this blockbuster in the works and he's just building up demand but i don't think so at this point 
I hope he does because Francis Nagano is, is, is always been just an absolute pleasure to deal with and an absolute gentleman. Now I've heard that sometimes in negotiations, some of his employers don't feel the same way, but at least in my personal, you know, conversations with him, he's always been kind and I'm hoping for the best for him. But I, in the same way you said, I'm kind of worried for him because you see these major players going out. And I thought it was very interesting. Shatri Sitchitong from one championship was the one that said that. And, and to go, as you said, you quoted specifically non-financial factors. Now to say that, immediately brings to, to light the things that you said that he's talked about before is, Hey, I want like representation at the table for fighters with these organizations and business negotiations and all those things that are very difficult to do at the USC level, of course, but for these other organizations who don't have the same kind of infrastructure, even more difficult. So, but I thought it was, I, I do still think money had to have been at least a part of it. I mean, it, it's gotta be, it just money's a part of every kind of discussion like this, but Here's what's wild is that he only needs one good offer. Like, it doesn't matter how many players you have in the game. You just need one good deal to get done, and you're taken care of, right? But getting one good deal is a lot easier when you have a bunch of options, and especially if you know you've got people bidding for each other. And, and now, not only do you not have offers on the table, but you have people publicly saying, like, by the way, we're not bidding for him anymore. So it's like if you're in an, if you happen to be in a, in a negotiation with him and you know that the other people he might be getting offers from – have verbally said we're not even involved in talking with him anymore. Now, where does your offer go? Does it drop down a little bit? Because now you know there's nobody else bidding for the services. So all of a sudden, your asking price goes down a lot. So I'm really worried for Francis Nagano as well. I hope this works out in his best interest. Again, he only needs one. If he can sign one of these big boxing matches, you know, there's been discussion and maybe we can get this Deontay Wilder fight. But now you see all these, these top names in boxing are going over for this event in Saudi Arabia, and Francis Nagano's name wasn't in there. So – it's a weird situation because he only needs one offer, one deal to make every choice that he's made right. But all the options seem to be going away day by day. And, and, and the longer you're away from the sport, you know, the less people are calling for you and the less they're saying they need to see you. So it's a concerning time for Francis, man. I, I hope that he's got the master play taken care of and he knows what he's doing here. But I don't know. It's getting a little bit concerning. Yeah, it it really is, and and uh, you know his last fight, I believe, was January twenty two. Yep, that was a long time ago, right? Yep. Cyril gone, he retains, or actually, it was vacant at the time. No, he retained in that fight. Right. Okay, he retains in that fight, and uh, I mean that was a long time ago, and you know, no disrespect to Francis Ngannou because I pay to see him, but I'm a diehard. If you're out of sight, out of mind. I mean, this, and, and to your point, you know, bidding power and negotiating power goes down out of sight, out of mind. And, you know, that's just economics one on one. If you don't got one person to play off the other, the dollars ain't going to be there. It's, 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 it's scary. And like you said, the longer you're away, you know, the less that maybe people remember how much they want to see you and then your value could be impacted. So listen, and, and I want it to be clear. I want nothing but the absolute best for Francis Nagano. As you said, I pay to watch the guy fight, man. He's an incredible force. He's an incredible figure. His story is incredible. Like where he came from, what he battled through to get here. Um, unbelievable. I mean, look, he's already won. I mean, from you think about where he came from yeah. and the amount of money he's already made and where he is. I mean, this guy won. He came from nothing and made himself something. So even if he never fights again, what he accomplished is incredible. But you know that he was looking for that big opportunity here. And, and just so far, it doesn't seem to be materializing. So um, hopefully he knows exactly what he's doing. And, and as I said, he's got the next play in mind. Yes. I mean, I guess to just put a button on that because, you know, what we don't know uh... – what we don't know about these situations is probably more than we do. So who, who, who really, really knows? But uh, before we get into the fight card that I am just so clamoring for, little uh, just this past weekend, UFC fight night, uh, Ricky Simone versus uh, Song Yudong. And, you know, Song Yudong, it, we said ex exciting fighter ends up uh, with a TKO victory. 24, 23? That's... Young kid, man. It's, it's young, incredible. and that's, and that's I mean, basically where I wanted to get into. He was kind of 25 rushed now. He's 25 now. Oh, 25. 25. He's only 25. Let's put it that way. He's Insane. only 25, and the potential that he really has, especially now as he gets a little bit older, maybe calms down just a smidge. But man, I, I'm excited to see his career. Um, did you take away any big notes from this past weekend? You were there. Phenomenal performance. I thought Ricky Simone was going to be able to make more of a fight out of it. You know, to be honest with you, I thought that his grappling game was going to cause some problems, and it just didn't. I mean, Song Yudong's 
uh, defensive wrestling, his defensive grappling was spectacular. It was on point. Uh, his striking has always been great, but it just seems to be getting even better. Uh, and and you heard Uriah Faber, his coach, talking about it afterwards. You know, he's got this championship mindset. You know, he really truly believes this song will be a champion at some point. At just 25 years old, I mean, he's just now coming into his like physical maturity, uh, that grown man strength. You know, and it just seems to be getting better. So yeah, this kid could absolutely be a future champion. That division is deep, man. That bantamweight division is packed with talent. Um, but this is a name to remember in in, in that 135 pound class because this was a spectacular performance. I know the, the the majority of eyeballs were talking about BKFC, and so maybe this performance went a little bit under the radar. Um, but I mean, he he, he dominated. I, I had him winning every single round until he ends up getting the fifth round stoppage. Even that in itself is amazing to keep pushing for the stoppage all the way to the end. You always love to see that. Could have cruised to a decision, but no continuing to go continuing to drive guy guy looks phenomenal man it seems to just be getting even better so uh, I, I do believe this man will fight for a title at some point let's stay in that division ufc 288 this saturday the human backpack Aljermaine sterling 22 and 3 takes on the returning the former never lost his title dual Dual division champ, Olympic gold medalist, 16 and 2, Henry Cejudo. Are you as fired up as I am? I am. I I, I love this fight, man. I mean, I, I think these are these are two phenomenal fighters. You know, there's a, there's a lot of hurdles, of course, for Henry Cejudo coming back after three years away. But, you know, I was actually talking to my wife yesterday about this. I mean, an Olympic gold medalist. You know, there's something different about somebody that reaches that level of, of athletic success. They've got a different kind of mindset. So if anybody can deal with coming off the couch after three years away, and let's be honest, not coming off the couch. He's been in the training room. He's been coaching. He's been involved in the sport, both from a, a technical standpoint and analytical standpoint, as well as just being out there on the mats. I mean, he goes out there and trains with this guy. So stylistically this is incredible what's on the line is incredible the storylines around it are incredible so yeah i'm absolutely fired up for this fight have you looked at the line i have not looked at the line okay, okay. I, don't, I, I, it, don't i'm gonna put you right. on the spot all right i have got to say i look aljamain sterling the reigning champion the more active champion also not necessarily the most popular champion henry cejudo former title holder dual division as you said didn't lose the title, but walked away through retirement. But he's coming back after three years away. But he's also and, – and, and listen, there's some fans that don't necessarily love him as well. He is the king of cringe as yep. well as – I'd say more than not. <laughs> You're probably right. So I'm going to say probably not a lot of fan sentiment value in either name. I'm going to say it's dead even. I'm going to say it's a pick It is 100% a pick most minus 113. So you don't dead get even. any odds on either person. Wow. Unbelievable. That's right. But you know what? I, I think that's about right. I, I, I'm surprised it's a dead even. I was kind of thinking, because again, sometimes you see some, you know, some, some fan attachment to a particular name. And so for that reason, the line will raise a little bit because the, you know, the, the bookmakers know that, Hey, people just love to put their money on that guy. I don't think either guy has this and stylistically it is an intriguing matchup. I might've even said maybe favor Aljamain a little bit with that time away for Cejudo. Cause that's a challenge, but I think Pickham's – I think that's what makes it so – that's why we get excited about fights, Eric. When we get this excited about fights – because there's a lot of fights you and I look at and we go, well, I mean, it could be a good fight, but I'm pretty dang sure this guy's going to walk away with the victory. Right. you know. And so it, it, you get excited about it because you want to see people perform. But when you go into a fight going, I don't know, bro. I don't know. I, I wake up one day and I see it this way. I wake up the next day and I see it that way. That's what gets you excited. Okay. We're going to break this fight down, but without that, before we do that, we need to touch on this co-main event. Clearly, a title eliminator fight. I mean, clearly, there's no ands, ifs, or buts. It is for the number one contender spot, and that is Bilal Muhammad, 22-3 and three versus Gilbert Burns, 22-5. and five. I don't know what to make of this fight. The the putting it together was pretty wild fast. Um, I don't know what that says about how urgent they are to get a number one contender because it might have something to do with Colby later with uh, who knows. I don't know. Or it's just they don't think that Aljermaine Sterling and Henry Cejudo might pull as much from the casuals as it's pulling 
for us. So, but they made this co-main event very, very fast. And I'm just fired up for it because we're going to break down this uh, fight, this main event fight. But with Bilal Muhammad, great wrestler, cross-trained with Khabib, you know, good striking. Gilbert Burns, Jiu-Jitsu World Champion, packs major power. His striking it has drastically improved. Um, I'm fired up for it, too. Love it. Yeah, I mean, from a UFC perspective, obviously, they just wanted to add some star power to the card, right? You did have Charles Oliveira, Benil Dariush on this card. That got moved back a month uh, due to an injury. So they needed to put another fight on here to kind of, you know, justify the price of that pay-per-view. So they wanted to put a big fight together. So that was their motivation. But as far as these two fighters, I think Bilal Muhammad and Gilbert Burns are those two guys that feel like they're the ones that aren't getting discussed enough in the welterweight title picture, that aren't being discussed as the next number one contender. And, and for both of them to take this fight on short notice, for both of them to say, you know, oh, yeah, by the way, let's do it at five rounds so there's no excuses about, oh, well, if I'd have had a few more, it would have been different had this been a main event. I mean, they deserve all the credit in the world for doing that, and, and I absolutely agree. Whoever wins here is next. You know, they, they may have to wait on Colby Covington. I think they both would argue that they shouldn't have to wait on Colby Covington, that they should be next overall, and maybe they will. We don't know how things are, are kind of getting done with all that negotiations, but at the very least, uh, the winner of this fight should be facing the winner uh, of Leon Edwards versus Colby Covington. It's a big one at 170 pounds. I get the star power needed to add to the car now that Oliveira is out and, and all those reasons you talk. There, I don't know why I can't get this out of my head. It seems just there's a sneaking little suspicion in the back of my head that there's an issue with Colby Covington and Leon Edwards. Leon Edwards flat out said, I don't, I don't want to fight the guy. He didn't earn it. Right. Right. Colby has all this legal mumbo jumbo surrounding the Jorge Masvidal stuff going on. There is just something in the back of my head that says we need a fight for this summer with Leon Edwards. Yeah, you you may be 100 percent right. I mean, Leon, as you said, he came straight out and said, look, I'm not fighting that guy. He doesn't deserve it. What's he done to earn it now? You know, unfortunately, that's not necessarily the way it works, but you can't force a guy to fight either. So if he wants to sit out and wait, he can. And look. The UFC was trying to do a pay-per-view in July in London, and it didn't happen. Obviously, a big part of that is because Leon said, I'm not fighting. So I don't think your theory is crazy. And I don't think Leon's point of view holds any weight, truth be told. Make no mistake about it. Colby Covington was widely considered the clear number two welterweight in the entire world for so long, and his only losses were to Kamaru Usman. So yep. I don't think that holds any water. Um, I personally believe that uh, it's a horrendously bad matchup for uh, Leon Edwards. Not saying that Leon Edwards ain't going to win the fight because you saw what he did against another wrestler in Usman. But right. with all that being said, that's I keep on going back to why did they force feed this fight so quickly? And yes, the star power needed to add something because they lost some fights. But that just always has resonated with me. I, I think I think you're on to something. I, I think there is absolutely something. I think they realize, like, the USC is always taking a couple steps ahead, right? We got to make sure we have something in place. So, you know, it, it, again, if everything works out the way it's supposed to work out, hey, then these guys are next, and we know who the clear number one contender is. But if not, and there is an issue there between Leon and Colby, whether it be through Leon's uh, point of view, whether it be through Colby's legal matters, which, right, I mean, Jorge Mazadal, I think, came out and played that perfectly, right, where he said, hold on, I thought you were suing me because – you have brain issues, but yet you're going to take a prize fight. How does that work? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, I, so, I mean, there, there, there are a lot of different scenarios that could be causing some complications here. And it would be nice to say, well, we got another one in place. We know exactly who's next. And these guys will both step up. You, they, they've proven that against each other and they'll, they'll do that for the title as well. So let's get back to this main event because gosh, man, off the couch, three years, Henry Cejudo taking on Aljamain Sterling, who in reality has looked better and better every fight and he says his shelf life at 135 is going to be very very short um he says he'll smash Cejudo he'll then go and smash O'Malley and then he's out he's publicly said that but he has gotten better and better every fight and if you even saw them uh you know rub elbows together uh just yesterday at the fighter hotel Hundermain Sterling is huge yep compared to Henry Cejudo yeah, he really is. And, and boy, you talk about uh, kind of comfortable slash uncomfortable interactions between those two, that video that's making its way around social media. It's like all respect, definitely some tension in there. I think there's some sizing each other up a little bit, a bit of the mental games already being played. Uh, obviously, you know, the, the, the talk and all this and the buildup to it has been there. So 
uh, yeah, ex- excited. I'm excited to see this whole fight week play out and lead up to what happens on Saturday. Okay, so we've done this on the major big, big, big fights. We're going to use our expert analysis to try and break this fight down. Now, this is going to be particularly tough. Even Vegas has no idea. Pick them, minus 113 each fighter. So usually when people are looking at fights and they're going to break it down, they go to strike. Who's the better striker? Who's the better grappler? We add another category in there because, uh, you know, as people that have covered this sport, competed in this sport, whatnot, what have you, we understand the depth. Like at this level, it's minute little deep details. So we have to put transitions in there because that is so much a part of mixed martial arts that people widely overlook. And if you even go into training camps, they're practicing all these transitions over and over because they know how important it is. So to break it down, we're going to go striking, grappling, and then transitions. And transitions can mean anything from a scramble or transitioning from strikes to takedowns or from transitioning from on your back to back on the feet. All the above gets put into that category. So we're going to go one by one, breaking it down. Who has the advantage between Aljermaine Sterling and Henry Cejudo in striking go? Man, here's what's interesting about this. Because to me, I think the simple answer is that Henry Cejudo has the better striking, right? You think about the boxing background that he has. You think about um, just the, the results of their fights and what we've seen on paper, right? So the, the easy answer here to me is to say that Henry Cejudo has the edge in striking. I think he's more fluid. I think he's more versed. Um, I, I think he packs more power into his shots. So I, I go with Henry Cejudo. The caveat being in this matchup, a seven-inch reach discrepancy. You talk about how much bigger Aljamain Sterling is, and it really translates to that reach as well. So, you know, Henry Cejudo's got to get in and get out. Now, can he do that? He absolutely can. He's done it his whole career. He's, he's been uh, the shorter uh, opponent against a, a lot of fights that he has, so he's used to that. But he hasn't done it at game speed for three years, and that's where you think about the timing. You know, yeah, you can spar all you want. You can drill all you want, but nothing is full game speed until you get in there in an actual fight. So he hasn't done it. So I'm going to stick with my answer that I believe Henry Cejudo has the better striking. But what I will say is matchup-wise, I got a lot more question marks than I would against a shorter opponent or, or if Henry hadn't been, you know, out of action as long as he has. You'd made me second guess myself which doesn't happen in this game a lot. Like I'm pretty right. convinced and I think I have an eye and an analytics brain for it, but I'm going to have to go with Aljamain Sterling or not. I'm sorry, not Aljamain Sterling, Henry Cejudo, <laughs> even though you made me almost think maybe, maybe Aljamain, yeah, yeah. but Henry Cejudo. And yep. here's what I'm going to say is because yes, we know he was a golden gloves boxer growing up. We know he does have great and he knows he has always been able to transition his uh, boxing into his wrestling like tremendously effectively. Yep. But this is the best avenue for victory for him. And the only reason I say that, and that's crazy to say from an Olympic gold medalist, that's a crazy hot take, but it's his best avenue of victory. I agree. And it's really because yes, he's giving up seven inches. Yes. He's giving up activity, but I I can't recall a fight where Al Jermaine is saying, you know what, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to knock this guy out. It is not right. his game. And for him to retrain himself to be dominant in that area is going to be played. It's not going to provide good dividends for him. And so that's right. why I'm going to, that's why I'm, I'm leaning heavily now. I just talked myself into back moderate. <laughs> I just talked myself back into heavily. And that's why is Henry Cejudo can do it all. So can Aljamain Sterling. It's just at that striking, Henry historically can do it a lot better. And he's used that avenue to set everything up where I don't think Aljamain really fights that way. So no. that's the fastest way to victory for Henry Cejudo. I mean, he has knocked down. I mean, you look at TJ Dillashaw. He dropped him with his hands. Yep. That's the clearest now. He didn't have the reach, but that's the best avenue to victory for him. So I am leaning heavily to Henry Cejudo for those reasons. 
Yeah, I, I 100%. You laid out the case really nice. I think the big question mark is just like, like if there was a way you could tell me, like, John, uh, we actually just ran Henry Cejudo through all the metrics at the Performance Institute. He did all of it. His numbers are exactly the same as when he walked away in 2020. You know what I'm saying? Like, if I know I'm getting 2020 version Henry Cejudo, then I'm 100% confident in everything you just said. But has there been a tail off? <laughs> has there been a little right. drop off over the course of three years? I mean, Cejudo's not an old guy. You know what I mean? He's not like in his 40s, but he is 36. He is getting up there for combat sports terms. So um, I agree with you. I agree. I think that's the right pick, and I think you're right. It's just those question marks that I'm interested in. So there was this interesting statistic. It was a MMA journalist uh, gave this statistic. Actually, I read it yesterday. That in championship fights with fighters over the age of 35, they are two wins and 22 losses. Those only two wins coming by Tyrone Woodley over Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. That is wild. Crazy. I did see that. And I, I believe it was Luke Thomas that, that put that one out there. And so, yeah, that is that. I mean, that is a significant. I mean, a that's that's not like, oh, this happened one out of three. I mean, that's a significant number of fights. Like that's a big enough sample size to be like, hey, I really see a trend here. And it's incredibly one sided in the results of it. So pretty wild. How many Olympic gold medalists were in that, though? That's right. And hey. If the, the two were both by one guy, maybe just some guys are built for that and the others aren't. And, and, and is that Olympic gold medalist the guy that's built for it? So, interesting. All righty. So, striking Cejudo, Cejudo, we both agree on that for albeit maybe different reasons, but we, we can agree on that. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Very interesting. Very grappling. Interesting. Now, what is grappling? Grappling is jujitsu. It's sambo. It's, uh, you know, it's uh, wrestling. It's, uh, you know, all the above. It's considered grappling. Yep. Now you have a guy who is like, can take anybody's back at any moment, any time and choke him out. And he's great on top too. Let's not forget that. Going against an Olympic gold medalist. Uh, you go first. Listen, I've heard Aljamain Sterling say that if he was going into a straight wrestling match with Henry Cejudo, he could outpoint Henry Cejudo. I respect the confidence. I disagree with him. I think uh, Henry Cejudo, especially his wrestling in mixed martial arts, that he's so smart. Not only is he capable, I mean, you watch some of his instructional videos when he talks about, you know, the science and the mentality of what he's doing. It's not that I'm just bull rushing in or I just have one go-to technique. I mean, He's a phenomenal wrestler. And so I think Henry Cejudo has the better wrestling. But that was not the question. The question was, who is the better grappler? And you said it. The human backpack, the human Jansport, the human anaconda, Aljamain Sterling is so good at taking your back and so good at finishing you from that position and not giving up to that position and can be so dangerous for so many places. I mean, you know, he'll hit a Sulu-esque stretch on you, man. I mean, we got all kinds of arsenal weapons in the arsenal that he's got. Um, and, and, and again, I think he's better than he ever has been right now. Just continues to get better. So while I do believe that Henry Cejudo is the better grappler, is the Olympic gold medalist wrestler, I, I, I believe that the best gra overall grappler is Aljamain Sterling. That is a hot take, but not a crazy hot take. If you're going to say that an Olympic gold medalist is not as good of a grappler, that is insanity just to say out loud but it makes complete sense at the same time <laughs> as soon as you said it i was like wow that does sound pretty bad to say but i think it makes sense you know what and i don't disagree with you mm. for all those reasons and here's why i'm gonna say the way i look at fights is how can you win from a particular position and who's got the more if i'm looking at it in totality who's got the more uh chances and and opportunities to win that's how I break down a fight in totality. If I'm going to break down it in one subcategory that is grappling, then I, ha then I have to do it that way. Or I'd be like, my whole take would be hypocrisy. So if you were going to say that, I do have to go with Aljamain Sterling as crazy as that sounds. He's going to out grapple an Olympic gold medalist. That is insanity to say out loud, but I agree with you. Aljamain Sterling, for the reason of he can win in more positions on the ground, than Henry Cejudo. He can, I, I don't think he's taking him down or he may up against a cage. He can maybe be able to bully him and power him there. You know, for some reason he ain't blast doubling Henry Cejudo. You know, he may get a trip transition takedown who knows, but when, when, and if it gets to the, to the ground, Henry Cejudo has to be on high alert and he can't use a lot of just the embedded ingrained wrestling technique of sitting out and, 
and doing all these things. He can't do that. So for all those reasons, Aljamain Sterling has more ability to finish a fight on the ground than Henry Cejudo. That is why I'm going with Aljamain Sterling. I completely agree. I mean, look, you broke it down in, in phenomenal fashion. But, I, you know, if you want to take an easy look at it, you know, how many, how many submission wins does Henry Cejudo have? Zero. He's got none. Meanwhile, Aljamain Sterling has eight. I mean, that's just so – I mean, just – if, if you want to make it easier than anything, just look, look at that because I, I, I think you're 100% right, man. The, the better wrestler is Henry Cejudo. Uh, he's going to have great takedown defense, but as you said, he's got to be in high – because that's the great thing about high-level attacking jujitsu is you can shoot a double and it doesn't work, and now you just transition around the back or you spin down and you drop a leg and you invert under. You have so many options available to you. And then you go back and add that size difference as well that we talked about. algin has got those long limbs where he can attack from angles that Henry can't, so – I, I, again, I don't think it's crazy, even though he is an Olympic gold medalist wrestler. I think Aljamain's the better grappler. All right, so basically it's tied up. We still don't have know who's winning yet. It's one one in the best of, in the three scenarios that we laid out to recap: striping, grappling, and transitions. What is transitions again? That if you ask, it's going from standing, you know, standing position to the ground. If it's on the ground, going from one position to another position on the ground. If it's on the ground, going from the ground up and protecting yourself from taking maybe a knee or kick or an elbow. It's all of that. So whenever it's not solidified on the ground or if it's not solidified on the feet and, and or even if it's on the ground and it's not solidified in one particular position, that is what we're labeling as transitions. With all of that being said, I'm going to task you with an impossible task. Who do you think is going to be better in the transitions here? It's so crazy because of the way they treat the transitions, right? When you think about Henry Cejudo in terms of grappling, you've got to think it's going to be more about defense, submission defense, and doing work with his hands, right? I mean, he's so good at doing damage and breaks and clinches and, and being offensive in there, whereas Aljamain Sterling, when he wants to create scrambles and he wants to create transitions, he's going to be looking to jump the back. He's going to be looking to attack a limb. He's going to be able to implement his jujitsu. So I will say, honestly, gosh, this is, you said it, it's an impossible task. I will say that, honestly, I think Henry Cejudo is better in transitions than Aljamain Sterling is, except that when Aljamain hits his transition the right way, he is now in a position to finish the fight. Where he's, you know, he's, if he hits his transition the right way to where he's taking your back, and now he's got the figure four around your body, and now he's searching for that rear naked choke, it's tough, so... You just you gave me a no answer there, Mr. Morgan. I know because I, I'm, I'm good. You know what? I'm actually going to say. No, nah, I'm going to say Aljamain. I was going to say I want to say Henry because man, I think about the speed that he has, and I think about how he moves, and I think about the fact that he can, you know, transition at, defensively and safely and get out of positions and tag you with strikes. But he's not necessarily hitting you with that one shot concussive knockout power. And Aljamain, I, I think about what he does is being able to transition to your back and get there. And look for the submission. So for that reason, I'm going to say Aljamain. But man, if I could say Ty, I'd say Ty. <laughs> but you can't. So Aljamain. But I can't. So I'm going with Aljo. Okay. Oh, man, I, like <laughs> I have agonized over this because I, I I put the run sheet together. Now mm -hmm. I put Mr. John Morgan on the spot. I have had a lot more time to think about this. Okay, and this is where we are going to differ. I am going to go with Henry Cejudo. I can't blame you for the reasons are is uh and you might have it up uh out of uh, out of um henry cejudo's two actually i know it off the top of my head you don't even have to look it up out of henry cejudo's two losses it was a, a body shot knee by demetrius johnson right and he lost a split decision uh to uh joseph benavides correct back-to-back -back fights while weight was an issue in both right of them. right okay so I've never seen him be submitted. Okay. True. And I have to take that into account. Now, grant, granted, he's not gone against an Algermain Sterling. But I think that he is a good enough, uh, I mean, world-class enough grappler and a great enough wrestler that the one quality that wrestlers really, really have is they can engage and disengage in a heartbeat. 100%. Right? And even if you watch great high-level wrestlers in high-level jiu-jitsu tournaments, when they get caught in something, they don't try to transition away from the – they don't try and transition a counter to the move. They are out of there. Yep. 
in yep. a split second notice. And that's where I think this transition period is going to have to go if Henry Cejudo ha- is going to win this. And yep. um, he has the ability also from on top to get Aljamain maybe off his side and put his shoulders completely on on uh, on on his back, both of his shoulders on the mat uh, from like, say, a half guard position or something. He's a good enough wrestler and powerful enough to do that. And then mind you, my last and final of why I came to this is wrestlers have an uncanny ability to scramble back to their feet when they want to. Now that is going to be very tricky for Henry Cejudo to do because that is where Aljamain Sterling jumps back slot lots of times. But if there's anybody who can do it at the highest level, it has historically been Henry Cejudo. So if, we, if, we, if I take everything in totality, Henry Cejudo can eliminate out of submissions right away if need be. It's a characteristic of high-level wrestlers, especially in the jiu-jitsu world. Two, he, um, you know, he's good enough to flatten Al Jermaine out. And that's what you watch these things. Like, you have to get a jiu-jitsu guy flattened and elongated out. And that takes away tons of submissions. I think Henry Cejudo can do that and can do it effectively. And then if all else fails... If he gets put down, Henry Cejudo, another characteristic trait of great high-level wrestlers, they know how to scramble to their feet effectively, fast, and safely. For those reasons, I'm going Henry Cejudo. I, I love it, man. I think you lay out a great case for it. And I, and I wholeheartedly agree with every one of your points, and that's why I struggled with it so much. Because when you think about the transitions, everything you said is spot on. But when I think about that, it's it's more of defensive nature of transitions. The fact that he can get out of bad positions, whereas Aljamain, his is if he gets into that position in that transition into his preferred status. Now he's looking for the finish at that point. He's got you in a really bad spot. So that's why I say that's that's why it's intriguing. Those are going to be the points. Those moments, boy, that the first time there's a there's a wild transition in the first round, a wild scramble, and we see how it pairs up. You know, does Aljamain get a hold of something? Does he latch onto the body? Does he stay there? Or as you said, does Henry Cejudo just shove him off, back away, and reset and start striking again? That's going to be a really early so tone setter. Let, let me ask you a question. And this, in this, uh, I didn't put it in my analysis, but I, it just popped into my head, and um, I think it's going to play a big factor. How does Henry Cejudo take people down? Majoritively speaking. Uh, usually he'll get inside. He'll strike his way into a clinch. Clinch and then some sort of trip takedown. He is yep. unbelievable at that. Yep. When that happens, how do they usually fall? On onto their back or on their side. He's usually ending up in half guard or side control. Correct. Which then Algermain then now has to fight to get to where he wants to go. And then that makes it easy for Henry Cejudo. So I could see a scenario in this fight that Henry Cejudo comes in with his strikes and his takedown, gets one of his trip takedowns, lands a couple shots, and he's out. And that would be wise. That would be wise. You know, get get a couple, get a, get a little bit of damage on top. Try to get throw a little elbow in there. Maybe get a cut if you can. Land a couple shots and then back away. Don't say I I I I can't imagine. And you said it at the start that the best place for Henry Cejudo to win this fight is on the feet with the striking. And I agree with that. I cannot believe. I cannot imagine that the game plan that Henry Cejudo and team have put together involves extended uh, grappling sessions with Aljamain Sterling. That just Not to say that he can't compete there, not to say that he is a phenomenal grappler. It's crazy for us to say with an Olympic gold medalist. But, but that's the one. But what are you trying to do, right? You're trying to minimize your own risk every time you're out there, right? What can I do that's going to take away weapons from my opponent and still allow me to be me? And I think they've got to believe, hey, we can beat Aljamain Sterling. If this was a kickboxing match, we take ourselves all day long. If it's a grappling session, we think we're better, but we would give Aljamain Sterling some opportunities there that we don't necessarily want to expose ourselves to. So it is crazy to say, but if you're game planning, it would seem to be a smart one. So, uh, I, you know, we, know, we don't put uh, John Morgan in position to make predictions here because he's an analyst. He has to deal with these guys day in and day <laughs> out, and we don't want them uh, beating the hell out of John Morgan for making a wrong pick or, and, or a perceived, and or a perceived disrespect. But guess what? I'm able to make predictions, so I'm going to go on the line here. Let's I'm going to say Henry Cejudo by unanimous decision. In a wildly entertaining yet boring at a lot of times fight, these these small little transitions and these scrambles are going to be wildly entertaining, mixed with a lot of inactivity in between. 
Um, but I, for those reasons, and I think because just Henry Cejudo's his fight game IQ is through the ch- through the roof, and I think that's why he's going to walk away with a unan- unanimous decision, albeit very very close. And he is not going to take a lot of chances in this fight. Ah, oh, man, I, I I could definitely see that's that's one scenario that is absolutely possible, man. I mean, th- th- that's what's great about this is there are so many scenarios possible in this, and I'm going to be on the edge of my seat. I I, I cannot wait to, to see this fight on Saturday night. And then next week, we're going to be talking about, is he going up to 45 to challenge Volk and become the first ever triple triple champ or, you know, three division champ. But, man, it is going to be razor tight. I, I Truth be told, and I'm a, I'm a, I, and see, I'm a grappling nerd. I'm a, uh, you know, I'm from, uh, from Arizona where Henry Cejudo is. And so I'm inherently a Henry Cejudo fan. Uh, but I don't, I can't recall being this, like, statistic. Uh, strategically excited about a fight probably ever oh dude for 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 the grappling fans like us man that, that love the grappling game because I, I i can see a lot of people won't you know if, if you're just kind of a casual fan you're more of a striking fan as you said there's gonna be some high level grappling exchanges in there and there's go, there's gonna be so many little subtle adjustments and things that are made along the way that i think if you're a, if you're a grappling fan you're, you're gonna enjoy it if not maybe you're gonna say as you said ah, not, not a ton of action but i i i'm intrigued by this oh by the way for the grappling fans, how about Mozart Evloev versus Bryce Mitchell on this card? Come on. We, that's going to be a fight. We didn't have the time to, to break this fight down, but I mean, what? Uh, he's 16 and 0, go against 15 and 1. And Bryce Mitchell being the one with the one loss. And Bryce Mitchell is a heavy underdog in this fight. Like, I mean, like Ooh. minus 250 underdog. Wow. I thought that yeah. would be more of a pick em. That's crazy as well. So Actually, that- I just looked at it before. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to double check. Um, give me one second. I apologize. That's all right. Uh, hey, by the way, I, while you're looking that up, I'll say another grappling for the grappling fans. Chrome Gracie is on this card as Woo-hoo! well, making his return against Charles Jordan. So, but uh, he didn't I'm, even I'm try and one. grapple his last fight against Cub Swanson. He just walked down like a zombie the whole time, made it like a crazy war. That was wild. That was minus wild. Just goes 290. Minus wow. 290. Uh, Evlov is uh, is favored over Bryce Mitchell. Minus 290. That's crazy. That's great. He's good. He's really good, but that's a lot. That's that's heavy. But that's that wrestling base that they think is going to um, really, you know, take out Bryce Mitchell and his uh, yep. crazy jujitsu. So, yeah, who knows? I love it. That's a good fight, though. I'm looking I, forward to that one. What are you doing for the fights this weekend? Uh, I'm going to be watching. I'll be in Canada, actually. So, I gotta, uh, I'm going to Denver. I'm flying out to Denver tomorrow. One Championship is doing their first ever event in the United States. Uh, Demetrius Johnson mentioned earlier, he's obviously going to be in the headliner there. It's the trilogy fight with Adriana Marais. They got Muay Thai with Rotten Chipman Wong is on there. You got the, the flyweight submission grappling world titles in there with Mikey Musmecki. Uh, Stamp Fair Tech, Sage North Cut. I mean, it's it's a stacked card. So I'm looking forward to that. That'll be on Friday. And then I'm actually flying out to Canada. Uh, I'm going to be working with Fight League Atlantic. So I'll be on the mic on Saturday night for Fight League Atlantic. And then, uh, man, I'll, we'll, we'll have that thing on in the background. And hopefully we wrap up before the main event so we can watch that. We're, we're, we're an hour past Eastern time out there on the Eastern seaboard of, uh, of Canada. So I'm hoping we get done early enough that we can do huddle around the computer and, and uh, have on the ESPN plus pay-per-view to watch that main event. Cause I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking, I'm tremendously looking forward to it too. I, 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 I'll be reminisced if I don't mention that, um, you know, with the good, there comes the bad, right? I'm, I, I happen to think I'm a very high level referee. I've refereed some big cards, some world championship cards on CFFC. I, I, I refereed a, uh, a uh, pro-am card this past weekend for summit fighting championships in Tupelo, Mississippi. And uh, I forgot his name, but for the fighter that I completely jacked up and I, I literally missed it. John, first of all, I missed a tap. It was a clear miss on my, my fault. And it cost the fighter, the fight. He ended up losing a split decision. Uh, Vic, he ended up losing by split decision and it was clear as day that he tapped, but he tapped with the arm inside. And so he was tapping under the back from my angle. You, as a trained ref, you run to the freehand side. So you make sure you could see the tap. Plus you could see if they go unconscious. That's why you always run to that side. And I missed the tap, but, and you've seen it in these shows, uh, you know, the cage side is a lot of, a lot of tables, right? Like eight person right. tables because yep. fighters, they sell tables to make extra money. And this fighter who ended up losing, who should have won if I didn't screw up, he had like five tables right on that side of the cage. So his entire family, 
friends, cheering section all saw the tap because they, they were in a better it. position than I was, and they went batshit crazy. Oh man, and they were out for blood, and they wanted to kill me, and I wanted to sink into a hole. So I say all that is like, man, I tremendously messed up this weekend. Luckily, the athletic commission already overturned it to a no contest, so it's like the fight never happened. But I want to apologize to you directly. It was 100% my fault. I will aim to be better next time. And to the guy who tapped and didn't stop fighting, have some freaking honor. That was some Bush League crap you did because you then fought for another three minutes after you clearly tapped and you knew you tapped. And it puts you know a guy like me in a really bad position. Plus, you had no honor. And, uh, man, crazy. They were like man. going – John Morgan, they were going nuts. I get it, man. I get it. I feel for you, man. You know, it's funny. It's, it is, especially when it's your friends, your family, your loved ones, man, it's so intense, right? I mean, the, the, the relation that they have from watching the outside, cause they know there's nothing they can do to help their loved one that's in there. And then you see your loved one get a win and doesn't get awarded that win. It's going to cause you to go crazy, but you know what? Props to you for saying, Hey, I made the mistake. I messed up. I recognize it. I'm going to get better. Look, it's, it's human beings in there. Everybody's going to make mistakes. And as you said, it's not that you were in the wrong position or that you didn't know what you were seeing. It's just that that hand was blocked from your point of view. And, you know, one would hope that maybe somebody else has a better vantage point than you with the commission that could help you out. But that didn't happen here, unfortunately. And as you said, man, as the fighter, if you know you tap, come on, man. And I know, look, I get it. Nobody wants to lose. And if you tap, you want to – no. If you tap, you, you know, admit it. But props to you, man. People make mistakes. It's it's a difficult situation, man. This past weekend, Chris Tyone, who I've seen do hundreds of fights, you know, he came up through the amateur ranks here at Tough Enough, and he's made it all the way to the USC level. He was getting questioned on a stoppage that, you know, gosh, it was a such a difficult call to make. Man, this is split-second things happening very, very fast, and fighter health and safety is paramount, and there's so much on the line. And it's not like other sports where maybe you make a bad foul call and then ah, we'll have a makeup call down here. You know what I mean? Yeah. We'll, we'll, no, the only calls you make are the ending of fights or the non-ending of fights. So, man, it is a, it, it is a, a great job to have, and it's cool that people like yourself are dedicated to doing it right, but it is also the worst job to have because uh, nobody ever says you do a great job. They just tell you you suck, but I respect you for, uh, for owning up to it, and I've seen your work firsthand. I know how dedicated you are as a professional. I know how serious you take this. And I think that's what people need to know. A lot of times people say, oh, these officials, what do they even know? What do they care? No, they know they care more than you ever know. These 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 judges, these referees, they beat themselves up over stuff and, and more so than you think they might. Uh, so props to you for owning up to it. And uh, I, I know you'll keep doing good work, man. Uh, well, I'm definitely going to try it. And I'm just, you know, now – it just gives me one more thing to think about. But anyways, UFC 288 this weekend. Triple C trying to reclaim. Aljo trying to retain. Man, I'm fired up. For John Morgan, I'm Eric McMahon. Enjoy the fights. <laughs>